What you can see right here is gradient infill, which means that you have a soft transition between the parameters and the internal structure of your 3D print. As far as I know, this hasn't been done by anyone in that form before. This method places material way more efficiently at the location where it's really needed. Let me show you how I implemented it, how it performs and even how you can use it as well. Let's find out more. Guten Tag everybody, I'm Stefan and welcome to CNC Kitchen. This video is supported by Skillshare, more on them later. Infill structure is the lattice material that is placed inside of your 3D prints so that you don't have to print them 100% dense and therefore using a lot of material and time where it's often not needed. Infill comes in a lot of different varieties and I've tested many of them already in the past. There hasn't been a lot of things going on over the recent years besides the current hype of gyroid infill which is a good choice for some applications but also not always. If you've ever had a course in mechanics or just use a bit of common sense you know that most mechanical parts are loaded the highest on the outside and way less in the middle. Look at a simple beam under bending. You have tensile stresses on one side of the part and compressive stresses on the other. In between there is a gradient with even one location where the stresses are zero. If we 3D print our part it will usually have a closed outer shell and then sparse infill structure in the middle. For our bending beam this means that our infill is not loaded equally. The parts closer to the shell are more loaded than the center. Ideally we'd need more material around the perimeter than in the center, but conventional infill doesn't give us this possibility. This is a simple example, but besides some very specific cases like pure tension, pure compression or Hertzian pressure, it's almost always the case that the core of the part is less loaded than the outside. In the past I've already tried to tackle this problem by my smart infill method where I simulated a part using finite elements and applied mesh modifiers to increase infill at the location where it's needed the most. This method works, but it's kind of complex and not implemented yet in any slicer. Wouldn't it be great to have an infill that gradually gets more sparse the further into the part it gets? Cura has its gradual infill, but that's more for getting better top layers with less infill in general. Kiss Slicer now has dynamic infill that allows you to change the internal ratio using a grayscale image. Pretty cool, but not 100% what I had in mind and unfortunately only available in the currently $82 premium version. I've been doing a couple of videos about extrusion width in the recent past, which basically is the parameter of how wide the line of extruded material is after it leaves the nozzle. During these investigations I noticed that it's possible to extrude lines of material way wider than the diameter of the orifice. Values of 300% and more are quite doable and even values below the nozzle size are possible. Now the idea that I had was if it's possible to use the variability in extrusion width to dynamically modify the amount of material that is coming out of the nozzle while printing the infill. This way I could put more plastic next to the walls and reduce flow in the center with existing patterns and only minor flow modifications. In order to implement that I didn't write or modify any slicer, but since Cura for example puts comments in the g-code where infill, perimeters and similar things start, I thought it might be possible to write a simple parser and post-process existing code. Therefore I coded a small script in Python. The idea was to first read out the perimeter lines in a layer and then calculate the distance of each infill segment to the closest perimeter. I first started with gyroid infill because this type of structure consists of many individual line segments. Each line segment is represented very simply in G-code. G1 means a linear move from the current position, X and Y define the next position and E tells the printer how much filament will be fed during that move. So each line segment is built up from the previous and the next position. For each I calculate the center and then search for the closest distance to the outline. I define the maximum and minimum extrusion multiplier as well as a gradient thickness. If the distance is within the gradient thickness I just interpolate between the min and max value, if it's bigger I use the minimum value. 
In my tests, I mostly use the range from 300 to 50 or even 0% and the gradient thickness of 3 to 10 millimeters. With this method, I basically ended up with the same G-code file in the end, only the extrusion amounts are slightly adjusted for the infill. Oh, and by the way, if you like this and my other videos, make sure to hit like and subscribe. Almost three quarters watching the videos on my channel still don't follow it properly. Unfortunately, most other infill like rectilinear or triangle are not composed of these small line segments, so the algorithm doesn't properly work, because I can't resolve a gradient with just one point. For this reason, I implemented a second variant that chops the line infills in around 1mm segments and calculates distance and extrusion amount for these individual ones. For those infills, the G-code files become bigger, but I didn't notice any performance difference due to the small segments. And damn, the results do look really nice, just as I intended. Even though I did a bit of programming in Java and C++ before, this was my first experience with Python. Learning the syntax and implementing the first idea for gradient infill took me around 4 hours with lots of tutorials I checked during that time. If you also have interesting ideas that you'd like to implement and automate with Python or any other programming language but don't know where to start, then definitely check out today's sponsor Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community and offers thousands of inspiring classes for creatives and curious people on topics including design, photography, video, making and more. Members get unlimited access to thousands of inspiring classes with hands-on projects and feedbacks from the community of millions. With less than $10 a month for an annual subscription, it's super affordable. Use my link in the description and get two months of free premium membership. If your New Year's resolution is to learn coding, stop procrastinating and go check out Max Schalwig's 90-minute introduction into Python and learn all the basics that are also used in my implementation of Gradient and Fill. Try it out risk-free and join millions of creators who are already learning with Skillshare. Thank you Skillshare for supporting my work. Before I started with the material tests, I played a lot around with individual settings and printed samples on my original Prusa i3. The adjustment of the flow during printing require quite a fast reacting extrusion system, where a direct extruder is definitely an advantage. And for this one, it really works well. You sometimes notice slipping of the filament, but that can be tackled by slightly higher temperatures or slowing the prints down a little. Even though it might be hard to imagine, but I currently don't have a single Bowden extruder printer at home, so I couldn't test if it also works for those. I've put a couple of sample files in the description, so it would be great if you give one a try and let me know how the results turn out. For testing if the gradient infill is really more efficient, I printed two different sample types. My usual test hook and also a simple bending bar, with which I'll perform a 3-point bending test to analyze the stiffness. I varied settings a bit, so that we can later compare how the results are at similar printing time and at similar weight of the parts, because for thin structures, gradient infill usually results in heavier samples. For the bending bar, I started with a part that had 30% rectilinear infill and post-processed it with a flow range of 25-300% to and 4mm gradient thickness. I also tested 45 degrees and 90 degrees infill orientation. The parts nicely show how the infill is denser on the outside and sparser on the inside. The gradient infill parts weighed 30% more in the end. I also printed out a 30% infill part without post-processing and a 46% part that had the same weight as the gradient infill parts. For the 3-point bending test, I loaded them successively in the middle with uh, calibrated soda cans and marked the displacements so that I can calculate the bending stiffness in the end. The results are really nice and show that the stiffness at the same weight is almost 30% higher with gradient infill. 
For this, I compared the beams that had the same weight. If we take a look at the stiffness that we can achieve during the same amount of printing time, we are almost 60% stiffer. Here I compared the 30% normal infill beam to the gradient infill parts, because with this method we don't add any additional printing time. Take this with a grain of salt, because depending on the shape of your part and the settings, your results may vary. For the hook, I also printed a couple of different infill ratios and then applied gradient infill to the one with 25% infill. I then tested all of them on my DIY universal test machine, where unfortunately I didn't find any significant improvement over just increasing the infill ratio. The reason here is that I add a lot of material in the areas where I don't actually need it. I will play around a little more with settings and see if I can improve something, but for such small parts it might not be a great benefit, at least in the current form. What I want to implement though is something similar as with my smart infill. I want to take the results of a finite element analysis, be it stress or topology, and map those results on the infill density by adjusting flow and not using modifier meshes, and this in all three coordinate directions. I'm quite interested how that will perform. I think these results show that this gradient infill method might not be the new perfect infill method, but it would be definitely beneficial for a lot of our parts to improve the material use, strength and stiffness. Just a step forward in the right direction. And maybe someone of you has an even better idea how to use or improve it. You're the ones that can be inspired by those ideas and take them to the next level. If you want to try it out on your own, you can find the Python script fully open source on my GitHub. I invite everyone to contribute and improve on it, because I'm a mechanical engineer and not a programmer. Oh, and did I tell you that I also lack the time to focus strictly on one project. If you're new to Python, you could start learning this programming language using the video sponsor Skillshare, or just download and install Anaconda, copy the script file and your decode in the same folder, open the script using Spider IDE, adjust the settings and hit run. This shouldn't require anything else. A more detailed description is also available on my website. Currently, the script only works with Cura, due to the section comments it puts into the G-code. And also make sure that you print parameters before the infill and activate relative extrusions, otherwise you might run into problems. Let me know what you think of this new infill type down in the comments and make sure to contribute on GitHub if you can improve my work. What I'd really like to see is this being implemented into a real slicer, because then it would be as easy to use for everyone as any other infill, and since the slicer itself has more information about the model being processed, you could also add a gradient in z-direction and not only in the xy plane as I'm currently doing it. Thank you so much for watching! I hope you have learned something new today and were maybe a bit inspired. If so, then leave a like, share the video with the rest of the community and make sure that you subscribe to the channel. If you want to support me in spending that much time on projects and videos like this, then please take a look at the video description. Also, check out the rest of my videos. If you like this one, I'm sure you'll also like the others. I'll see you in the next one. Auf Wiedersehen and goodbye!